Well, let me ask you this. Yeah, yeah. I'm taking over this conversation. Go ahead. <laughs> Are you a trumpet player? No, I'm not. Do I look like a trumpet player? No, I mean, I only talk to trumpet players. Oh, oh no. Uh, well, no, I'm sorry. I Listen, I tried the trumpet in high school and I went to the trombone because the mouthpiece is easier. Yeah, well, okay. You just move along the line, wherever you can fit your lips in, right up to the tuba. And then, uh, but yeah, the trombone was easier for me. All right. I won't. This is a family show, so I'm not going to get into nothing nasty <laughs> to say about that, but I'm not going to. Okay, let's, let's interview now that I've broken the ice. I, I feel like the way that Phil used horns was really unique. And to my ears, it's one of the defining elements of Phil's music, uh, along, of course, with his voice, which is really special, and the drums, obviously. Um and maybe I'm not listening to the right music, so correct me if I'm wrong. But it, he wasn't—he wasn't truly funk, uh, especially you know we didn't have those types of guitars, and he wasn't quite R and B. Um, there's elements of rock and dance and pop. In your mind, what role did horns play in Phil's music? Wow. Let me give you a little background on this. You know, during the seventies. Phil fell in love with Earth, Wind, and Fire. Okay. And he would show up rehearsals, and then he made friends with the Phoenix Horns, who was the horn section. And he, you know, he wasn't a household name yet. Yeah. Yeah, he just would hang out with them and hang out with Don Myrick, who was the sax player, uh, Louis Satterfield, who was a trombone player, and Romney Michael Davis, who was uh, the tr the trumpet player, and uh, the trumpet player that I ended up filling in for was Michael Harris. Right. All right. But he hung out with them constantly. <laughs> he loved that sound of horns, and he Don Myrick told me he heard him say it many times. When I do my solo album, I'm going to use you guys, mm. and he stayed true to it. When he got the opportunity to do his first solo album, which was, I don't remember, uh, late 70s, was it? Uh, uh, yeah, late 70s, yeah. Yep. He called him. So the arranger for the Phoenix Horns was a guy named uh, Tom Tom Washington. Right. Also used to write for Earth, Wind, and Fire. All right. So, you know, I'm an arranger. Our job is to enhance. But, you know, they send us a track, mm -hmm. a section track, with a, a sample vocal. Okay. And that's right to this. All right. And the thing is that it doesn't matter what style it is. You're an arranger. And you can imagine lines, melodic lines, whatever, in the style that the track or the, the rhythm section and everything is suggesting. Hmm. So it's the same thing as Earth, Wind, and Fire or anything else, Tower of Power. Well, it was less funk, funk like Tower of Power, but play in between the cracks. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Create a theme, you know, a horn line that, that people could hear and start singing. You know, I mean, that's the trick to arranging. Yeah. It is to come up with, um, what do they call that? Just... A memorable line. Yeah. Like a hook. If, if I say to you, I feel good, what do you think? Of? Right. Da -na 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 -na. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Good point. Looking for that. That's hilarious. And, yeah. You know, an arranger who is, I mean, you got arrangers who are jazz, has a lot of jazz roots, and uh, it turns out they don't write any hooks. Mm. They're just writing jazz lines and stuff like that. But you know, being conscious of commercial music is you want to you want to leave them with a hook line that people will walk out the room singing. Yeah. Even though it's a studio, you know, that's kind of complicated for people to sing with. But 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 they identify. You know, Phil was the 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 master of hooks. Every one of his songs, just about right from the beginning, you know what song it is. Yeah. 
Yeah. Oh, for sure. Right there, that's a hook, you know? Yeah. And, uh, you know, any one of those songs, Paradise, you know? Dun, 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 dun. Totally. That's a friggin' hook, man. You can you know that from the first bar. Yeah, absolutely. So he liked the sound of horns. He especially loved the excitement that horns project in a song. So 100%. you want to talk about, um, you know, horns and style. It doesn't matter. I always say you could put horns on any hard rock to anything. You, a good arranger could write a good good horn part. And uh, some people close minded, you know. I yeah. told uh, I was trying to get management to bring horns to the Genesis tour when they were planning it, because I listened to Genesis and it sounds so orchestral. Mm. I thought I'd get him in a orchestral brass section. You know, that's two, a great idea. These trombones and, and French horns, soaring French horns, pretty much not changing the music, but adding colors that are already in the music. Like they may be a synth line that would go great with a French horn just sweeping through it. And all of them. Well, it's not uncommon for, for pop stars or rock stars to play with the Boston Pops or to have a, you know, to have something like that. They're doing that now. Yeah. And then, you know, the response I got from the camp was, there's no horns, this 80s British rock. <laughs> couldn't talk them into, you know, the next thing I would have to do is get a bunch of guys, go in a studio and record over, a, you know, some oh, track. Yeah. yeah. But I could hear it. Like, like hey. that's incredible. And you know what's funny is that I think they brought in the backing vocals, which was even weird for, for them to support Phil's voice. And I think you could have done the horns instead of the backing vocals as a way to, to support the voice, to carry I, the melody. I visualized it, you know. Ah, that's spread, a great idea. Spread out in the back, back of the stage yeah. and not even lit up. Silhouettes of us playing. Yeah. 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 That, you know. That's genius. Well, I, I, I'm gonna, I still want it to happen. I'm not giving up hope. Maybe we're wearing tuxedo type thing. But I mean, the, are you here hip to the Chicago Symphony? Um, Ch the Chicago Symphony is well known throughout decades for its brass. Okay. The brass. Yeah. And especially the lower brass. Right. It, the trombones and, and, the, and the tuba and all that. Because if you listen to, to Genesis, there's all kinds of lower sounds that could be yeah. so dynamic. Anyway. <laughs> I they laughed at me they said no I, horns in british rock you know what and i mean i i think that now i would love to hear what the band would have done had they have done this like and you know i love that idea but also the idea of maybe bringing in the a, a, a small little orchestra ensemble to support them too i think would have been beautiful well yeah i mean that they're doing that all over the place um it would have matched the vibe too of phil sitting down it would have made it more intimate I, I've done several gigs. I, what did I do? You remember Grand Funk Railroad? Yes, vaguely, to the name. Did a thing with an orchestra. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Power Power was doing more and more gigs with a film, you know, so, so far. Harry, let's go back to recording, because I want to ask you, I had, I had heard that, we were talking about these hooks, I had heard a rumor that Phil would often sing something that he hears. Would he let you guys completely write it? Or would he sometimes say, I, I'm, I'm thinking of this, sing it, and then you transcribe it from his, his, his voice? The creative process includes all of that. Okay. He might sing something. He might just let it have it. He might give an example. You know, I want the Motown horns on this. Or you give a reference. You know, yeah. The, the certain voicing or something, you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, but the tracks, the rhythm tracks dictate that anyway. Okay, this is my next question. I'm very curious because we take a song like It Don't Matter to Me. Uh, I know uh, something happened on the way to heaven in the same way. Um, the horns are in unison with the with the drums. There's this, even the drum fills uh, are lined up. So tell me, I mean, I guess I, I think from what you're saying that the horns come second, right? Is there ever a time that Phil would would overdub the drums 
and and play along with some of these horn things because they're kind of interesting. They're kind of weird. Um, but there's times on some of these songs where the horns are playing along with the drum fills or even the ba 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 ba. You know what I mean? Well, that's the, an instinct of an arranger. You're given a rhythm section recording. And you hear a drummer do that, you of course you want to play that with them. Yeah. It's the way you do it. Uh, I mean, it gets real old if you're just playing one note and playing yeah. that. Yeah. But you could make up a melody while you're playing that rhythm. That's true. You know, yeah. There, there's just a lot of different ways to do it, but you definitely want to catch it because that's a high point. And the horns are, are there to accentuate the high points. So it, it all depends. I mean, yeah. you could hit a root note. You could hit another note, a different inversion of, of the chord. You could hit. Yeah. You could move around and hit the same rhythm. And it sounds different. And then, you know, it's 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 about creativity. Yeah, yeah. There's, um, I think I, I heard you recently talking about the, the opening riff to hang in long enough. And then that goes, and that plays those four beats on the snare too, right at the end of that, whatever you call it, uh, which is an incredible way to open a record. And then the ba 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 right from there. So, and you guys are playing along with the snare. So that's an example where you are writing to what the drums are doing? No, when, when we did the But Serious album, I was with the Phoenix Horns. Mm -hmm. And that guy, Tom Tom Washington, was the arranger. Oh, okay. I didn't have arranging authorities at that time. Right. I was just part of the horn section. Yeah. And when we got to that song, I remember we recorded the meat of the song. So, you know, ba ba da ba da ba. Uh, that's where we started recording. Okay. And then he said he wanted something spectacular to lead to that and the way it went down was uh the arranger and phil talked over many things many ideas and uh, for quite a while and we try this try that yeah yeah whole bunch of ideas and um it wasn't quite happening but during that time, I I gathered what Phil wanted. <sighs> He's a drummer. Yeah. He wasn't looking for something. You know how we do a Sunday night, no, Saturday night, Sunday morning? Yeah. You know, there's a lot of melody involved in his drum fills and stuff. You know, yeah. you know that's the opening of that. Which the arranger was writing stuff like that. Mm. He was writing basically bebop lines. But Phil wasn't, uh, I don't, I, I gathered he wasn't talking about bebop lines because, let's see, so you got hanging long enough, it's about this tempo. So if you write bebop lines, it's, it's in 16th notes. Okay. But he wanted something even more. So I came up with an idea in my head, not 16th notes, but uh, I, don't, I don't know how to explain it so that a non-musician could understand it, but really fast triplets. So instead of a line that goes, yeah. Groups of three, fast. So, oh my gosh, that's the excitement that he was trying to convey. And I think that the arranger dared not write something like that because it would be too hard. Mm -hmm. You know, this is what I'm gathering. Anyway, so after after spending a lot of time on this, uh, I said I have an idea. You know. It, which is not normally is not something you do. Yeah. You're just a side man. Yeah. But I have an idea, I told him. And um, so I showed the line to the guys. 
And then uh, I said, you got to give this, you got to give me the opportunity to sell this. Oh, okay. You record it and then double it and you'll get what I'm talking about. <laughs> so, okay. So the beginning is like one, two, three, four. Holy, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because that, 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 it didn't have enough life for what he wanted, but yeah. and he singing stuff, and, and, and it was crazy because he was singing triplets, fast triplets. And uh, actually, he wasn't even singing, he was beating on his lap. And, yeah, yeah. You know, those are those are triplets. So okay, so I did that. A very simple line. Yeah. You know, when you think about it. Yeah, for a for a brass player, it's not difficult. Because it all falls into place really nice. Right, right, right. Uh, but it's impressive. Yeah. And and he goes, I love that. He'd have this little smile when he was happy about something. <laughs> so I then recorded that. And then to my surprise, it was the first thing you hear on the CD. Well, I was going to ask you at that time, did you know this was an album opener? No, of course mm-hmm. not. Wow. I don't, you knew it. Yeah, that's right. So recorded. that's how much he loved that hook. Yeah, well, it's not even a hook. It's Yeah, that's right. Yeah, you're right. He says, was that a pivotal moment, do you think, in your relationship? Gaining his trust like that? Well, no, I don't know. I, I never patted myself on the back on that stuff. It was just, <laughs> I never wanted. So I was happy that everybody was cool with it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, man, it's great. It's iconic. Um, yeah. and, here, and, you know, I'll add this. He would once in a while ask me to put some excitement in sections of older songs you know, uh, that he felt needed. And he would call it, he says, let me have one of those slippery things you guys do. (laughs) Now, if you listen to the original uh, Susudio, the break in the middle, when it it goes down to um, guitar, just drums, uh, bass drum pretty much, and and then... It goes pop, 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 and then there's a bass lick. Yeah. Right? Yeah. In 1994, during one of the uh, sound checks, he said, Harry, Harry, can you can you can you add one of those slippery things you guys do in that way? <laughs> and I say, okay. And uh, so the next day I rehearsed it. I wrote something that night and 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 rehearsed it in the dressing room quietly with the guys. You know, my thing is always, if you're going to present something new to somebody, you got to sell it. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. When they're halfway, everybody... Show them how it's exactly going to be. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, so the next day, a sound check, because that was a sound check tune. Mm-hmm. Played every day. Oh, okay. And then when that came up, we hit him with the... You know, what was it? Yeah, it was also a triplet, fast triplet. You know... Uh, yeah. You could cue that up if you have it. The, well, that's, yeah, the, I mean, I can't play music on this show, but I, I'm curious. So this is the live version, right? Yeah, listen to any of the live versions. We we added that in 1994. Yeah. And right in the middle of it, you know, where, where the whole thing comes on and breaks down to the guitar and bass drum, you know, and then the whole band goes, da, da, da. and then we do our slippery thing. And the bass used to go Okay, let me see here. I okay, I got the '94 version here, so let me see if I can play it. Ah, oh, that's cool. That, that's, oh, that's not in the original. original. No, you're right. That's so cool. And did you stick with that for the for the yeah. decades? Yeah, that was one of our famous slippery things. <laughs> slippery things. So you knew what he meant when he said slippery thing. Yeah. 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 You that's know, awesome. I call, it, I call it razzle dazzle. <laughs> right. No, I mean, really, when I'm arranging or, or I'm in the studio and the, the, the artists told me specifically what they wanted. So we 
I, we record what they wanted uh, according to my arrangement. Then I said, wouldn't you like a little razzle dazzle here? And I already have something in mind. Then they go, well, what do you mean? <laughs> I'll put some razzle dazzle and they go, oh my God, yes, let's do yeah, that. Yeah. That, you know, it's like, whoa, all of a sudden. You know? I always ask a, a session musician to do, after they've done the takes for me, I like them to do a take for themselves. I, you know, do want, do something completely crazy. And it's 70, 80% of the time, it's the take we use, you know? Yeah. I, well, what I do in arrangement, I come up, I come in, I, I figure this stuff out mathematically. Oh, okay. So that if you change one note, you have to change things before it. Uh, okay. Yep. Yeah. You know, and, yep. and I should use the word mathematically. It's just, it's just the feeling, and and uh, but there are places where you could add, for instance, if you one of the razzle dazzle things I could think of is the the, the rhythm section. The whole band at one point went pop, pop, pop. And it did it several times. So the first time I wrote it with the horns like that. And then I had another thing in case they wanted some razzle dazzle. <laughs> and I played horns in between the hits. So I went shop da. So I hit all the accents, but oh, then wow. I added horn lines in between. Yeah. To, to give it a, a different lift, you know? Yeah. And that's awesome. All those notes, and you still have the accents, you know? Yeah. But yeah. That's the uh, razzle dazzle I'm talking about. Just something unexpected that make you go, Oh, did you hear that? You know? So uh, your, your term is razzle dazzle. Like, does every musician have different terms? Like, does it, I actually watched a lecture w that you taught how you said that you, you want there to be universal terms for some of these things. What well, was. Okay. Yeah, but razzle dazzle it means razzle dazzle. <laughs> There's no other uh, people have been using or that. slippery or is, right. That's different. That's new. Uh, <laughs> slippery is something very Phil Collins. And yeah. uh, when I say to the guys, let's let's come up with something slippery, they know what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah. Did you have other codes like that? Well, let's see. We had accents. Like if we if we wanted to add an accent, like in the very last part of a bar, like one, two, three, four, up. Yeah, you know, yeah. It's not on the beat. It's right before the beat. Yeah. Uh, 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 uh. We call that a sugar ray. Okay. Like sugar ray Leonard. It's like one, two, three, four. Uh, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> a big downbeat. One, two, three, four. Pow. You know. We call that, that reminds me of Phil's drumming. Sorry to interrupt you. That reminds me of Phil's drumming. He would throw a snare in there all the time. You wouldn't know where, yeah. really odd moments. Yeah. So there were times that things were not written in and then, and then I, yeah, or yeah. And I'll say, give me a sugar Ray right here, you know, yeah. cause it's not written in the part. Um, cause I might not have heard it before, but yeah. maybe we'll add it later. And then there's a sugar Ray which is one, two, three, four, stop, right? But then there's a sugar ray with a cough. <laughs> which is one, two, three, four. It's got this little... Yeah. The yeah. You know, so there, the, you can hear the, the stuff you're talking about. Is, for any non-musician, would still be familiar with it in a lot of Phil's music that, that there's the horns will just hit just do little hits here and there sprinkled throughout. I love that. Yeah. Well, that's Phil's a drummer. Yes, that's right. And so you guys are very percussive. It, uh, it enhanced his ego for us to follow some of the stuff. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you hear that stuff, the horns are playing. I came I wrote that. <laughs> yeah. That's so true. Here's yeah. a stupid question for you. Um, how come we don't hear any muted trumpet throughout the years? I think there's one time, maybe on Dance Into the Light, on a track, and just another story, maybe. And then I think there's one on his latest record on Testify, but I don't even think it's a real horn. But was Phil not crazy about mutes? 
Well, it most of the stuff didn't call from you. Okay. It was one of the things I had a muted trumpet solo. Do, do, da, do, do, da. Oh, on Come With Me, yeah. Do, do, do. Oh, okay. It's going to be all right. It, Just it, live, though. Yeah, yeah. And then... What was the first song you mentioned? Uh, uh, just another story, I think, on Dancing yeah, to the Light. We played a muted trumpet solo. Kind of a like a you know late night type of uh, um, sting sounding type song. Yeah. It was so funny. When we did that live, uh, it was just going to be me. And then I thought I'd include the other trumpet player. Because the other trumpet player didn't have a solo spot in the whole thing. So if you remember, it was a, it, in 1997, it was a stage in the round. Yep. And to get up to the middle section, there were steps. on, on Four steps, sets of steps. And I was on one. And Dan Fornero, the other trumpet player, this fantastic trumpet player, just exactly across from me. And... It was tricky because we have to get this mute in there mm -hmm. and then stick the mic that attaches to the bell. Okay. Very tricky because you yeah. can easily knock the mic, uh, the mute out of the horn while right. you put it in. So we used to laugh about this, that it's possible, you know, and it happened to me one night. I'm playing, and in the middle of my little solo, the mute just popped up, fell on the ground, and I, but I kept playing. Yeah. Right? <laughs> wow. Your friend, he, he, you know, his mute fell, and he lost his composure. <laughs> so he bends over to pick up the mute, and it rolls down to the next step. <laughs> so you hear this clunk. And then he follows it, and by the time he reaches it, it rolls down to the next step. Oh, oh no. And it's all happening in slow motion. <laughs> very moody song. And yeah. I'm on the other side cracking up. Oh, I my think gosh. Five little steps. And, uh, and I bet you that song was pulled from the set. <laughs> Phil was just standing on top looking at it. <laughs> just stuck with it. He would only get upset if it was something drastically wrong. Yeah. But he, 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 it was comical. Yeah. It was like it's something you see out of a, a comedy. Yeah. No, oh, that's funny. Oh, that is so funny. No, oh, that was like, when was that? 97? And, yeah. and we still laugh about that time you dropped your mute. <laughs> yeah. Why wouldn't you have a trumpet with a mute pre installed, like just a trumpet for that song? And the way that some guitar players have a song you, that the tech brings out a guitar just for one song. No. No. <laughs> no, it doesn't work that way. Yeah, that's right. Because, uh, <laughs> let me see, the mic clips onto the bell of the trumpet. Yeah. Then the mute goes into the bell. Well, it's not snug, right, because of the clip. It's, it is snug. And there's very little room for the mic clip to fit in there. Right. So you can put it in just right so it doesn't fall out. Yeah. And if you can't do it, you can't do it beforehand because what happens is, you know, the 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 mute has cork and it goes into the to the the belt, but um there's a moisture factor. The oh. moisture is what holds the cork in. Oh. And then when it dries out, it just falls out. Right. And this is for anybody who's ever seen trumpet players who are not trumpet players. It's not uncommon to see a trumpet player lick his mute before he puts it in the horn. Oh, I've never seen that before. It happens all to the time. To lick the cork? They lick the cork. <laughs> yeah, yeah, all around. They're wow. all the time, everything. And wow. then they put it in their horn. A lot like, of people, like me, I don't want to show off my, um, you know. Cork licking? I don't want to show off my amazingly enormous tongue <laughs> it's a great time for a commercial break <laughs> so i blow, I, I, uh, I blow warm air into the horn oh same effect okay yeah but, well they're not the same but 
to get humidity around yeah. it. Yeah, right, right, right. But some balls. It- oh, I'm glad I could ask you that because I, I was curious of all the horns. I guess I mean the sax plays that role a lot when it comes to a sultry solo. It's he turns to the sax a lot. Well, because he comes from that era. Yeah, that's right. When did you? When, what, a, what a, a sultry solo in the yeah. thirties is the trumpet. Yeah, that's right. That's a good point. And then during the forties and fifties, the the main sultry sound was trombone. Really? Yeah. I mean, I had to listen to that. Trombone stars. I mean, Glenn Miller. Sure. One of the big ones, Tommy yeah. Dorsey, and all those that trombone with the yeah, you know, yeah, a lot of things. And the sax became, um, I, I guess it was a vestige from the uh, early rock days and stuff. And in the 80s, sax solos were big. If you wanted to, if yeah. you want to suggest anything sexy, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah that's right. Um, a, I don't know if you ever seen that movie, um, what's the name of that with Danny Glover and uh, Mel Gibson, the cops. Two cops. Oh, Lethal Weapon? Or yes, yeah. Lethal Weapon. Yeah. Watch that movie and listen to the soundtrack. Okay. They, I believe, they hired Dave Sanborn, the great alto sax player. He just goes in and, and played. I believe it was random fills. That really? Was like emotional. It was sexy. Yeah. And I mean, that was the epitome of the 80s sexy saxophone. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's coming back around, but it, it, it was so tied to the 80s that it actually disappeared for a little while in the 90s and 2000s Yeah, in pop music. Yeah. I've gotten uh, called to record a lot of times um, Latin, Spanish-esque solos. They call it like they say they want. In, yeah, for pop music. Latin lover, you want yeah. that sexy, yeah. you know? Yeah, and, and of course I'm the guy, you know, very yeah. sexy Cuban guy here. <laughs> yeah, of course. Did you speaking? Of, <laughs> no, it's the, you. You've got the different filter on right now. I gotta uh, take, yeah, I have the <laughs> family, the family <laughs> rated, uh, filter. In what you know? What uh, while we're on this topic of Latin uh, music. What inspired Phil? And, and I'm 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 skipping ahead in the my questions because I want to go back to but seriously and and how you came into that orbit. But first, while we're talking about Latin music, what inspired Phil to go in that direction? That Latin, but also Afro influences on Dance into the Light, especially after a really stripped back record on both sides, and then we have an album Dance into the Light where you play on almost every song. Uh, what was the mindset of Phil? to do such a vibrant, upbeat record like that? Well, you know, Phil's a drummer. And he's a percussionist. Right. And uh, I think in 94, I think in 94, they, they did a lot of drum stuff between him and Ricky Lawson. I'm trying to get my ears straight. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's okay. It's just natural yeah. to explore yeah. Latin and African rhythms when you're a drummer. Right. You, you don't, you're limiting yourself. Yeah. Because, you know, most everything, every rhythm comes from Africa. Mm. It really I've does. That. Yeah. The swing, you know, the shuffle, it's all off the 6 8, you know. Mm. The, Ding That's how swing came up. Yeah, like colors. Uh, yeah, and yeah. so funk, all that stuff has African roots, and of course Latin. Yeah, that went from Africa to Cuba, Puerto Rico, uh, Brazil, all those countries, and so. If you get absorbed in all that, there are people who become musicologists to tell you exactly what rhythms came from there. Right. Yeah. yeah. That. But you, you, but yes, you need to know how to play them, at least know what you're hearing to enjoy it. You know, because I think this the, what they call the six eight, 
is the most complex rhythm on earth. Hmm. Why is that? Well, I was going to say, it's the most primitive rhythm at the same time. Wow. Every culture has a six, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. You know? And then, but that could be broken down into, you know, you got... Three, four, one, two, three, one. And then you got the... Let me see if I could sing it and play it at the same time. It, it could be subdivided in two. Yeah, it, it sounds tribal too. So you got three rhythms going on at the same time. And by changing one little accent, you could change the feel of the whole thing. Hmm. Yet the thing stays the same. And I mean, if you listen to some old African chants that, that went to Cuba, It'll start out with a um, right? Yeah. Okay, so so you got this this thing going. Check 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 The clave was born out of that. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you got this thing where, you know, you got somebody leading the scene and then there's a chant and it's in that check, check, check out, check, 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 And somewhere in there, suddenly it's Yeah. When did it switch? Wow. And by the time you realize that it's switched, you're on fire. It's, <laughs> you know, it's so uplifting because, it, you know, th- those things come from, you know, African spiritual things and sure. stuff. Yeah. The religion. So it starts with this. this right. It ends up. And it, it really riles up your spirit and makes you want to dance. It's crazy. And all those aspects are all boiled down to this one six eight thing that is the most primitive thing in all cultures, Middle Eastern, you know, even um, some indigenous. Yeah, I, w- I was thinking that when you were doing some of those rhythms. Yeah, although, you know, the indigenous thing, uh, there are a lot of people who will who will deny the six eight in in. American Indian, for instance, but okay. definitely in South America, hmm. it's some of the right. real yeah. primitive rhythms right. for the indigenous people. There's six, eight in there. And uh, that's the first thing that kids want to do is play six, eight. When they you give them percussion instruments, what is the spirituality behind six, eight? Wow, that is interesting. And then when you, when you really break down the six, eight in the manner in which it's used, it's really complex because yeah. it's three, four, five rhythms all in one. Yeah. And so anyway. Yeah. So sorry. Th- thank you for that. And I do want to look into that. Let's bring it back to Dance of the Light. What what was uh, I not knowing where the inspiration came from? But when did you get a sense? Were you told this is the a danceable record? We want to do Latin vibes. Um, when did that become so apparent? And and it transferred over into the tour, which you just talked about, doing stuff like Loco and Acapulco, which is an incredible tune, doing a couple other tunes like in that vibe, and even pulling out some older songs. So when did that start to form? Um, that was purely um, Phil. Okay, he knew ahead of time. Yeah, he was going to do a record. He sent out the demos, and... Uh, we all went to Switzerland to rehearse those songs. And being uh, as nitpicky as he was, always, yeah. a, he told me, I, I was telling him it was really sounding good now because, you know, all I thought that all his rhythms on the, on the demos were just a starting point, but you get live music to put musicians to play. It's going to really sound great. And I said, it's really sounding good right now, you know, because you had Luis Conte playing actual authentic rhythms yeah. and stuff. 
And he said, no. He said, it's getting away from me. Hmm. You know, and this happens a lot in the creative process, which which is why I don't like technology so much. When you when you sit there and you create your own music, you fall in love with your own music. Yeah, right. And you can't deviate from it. Demoitis. You know, in the old days, you got four or five musicians come in the studio, they play off each other, they create something amazing. Yep. When you got a guy sitting at home composing every aspect of it, Sometimes you get like that because all you see and hear is what you created and you fall in love with it. Yeah. And say, that, and let's let's get like world class percussionists to come in and do this whole section. And then he may hear it. I may hear it and say, Oh man, that sounds awesome. And he may say, No, nah, it's gotten away from me. So he but, said that. Yeah, he said that. So much of what you hear on that Into the Light album is his demos. Reined in. The music's reined in. Yeah. You didn't wow. Uh, you didn't uh you didn't get away from that. That's I mean, really interesting. We went to uh, Switzerland for two weeks because we were gonna develop it. The intention was develop the music and book some nightclubs. Wow. And perform them and then go in a studio and record it. Wow. That juicy, that that loosey goosey live feel where everybody knew what they were doing and all that. But before he even got there, he he canceled it. He didn't That's like. That's too bad. You know, I think that would have been really cool. That would have been really cool to hear a loose live album. Yeah, like that. We we thought it was cool, but <laughs> no, but he he really did. He 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 really felt like it, it was completely different from his original intent. Sure, that's understandable. Yeah. When you so you came into Phil um, through Butt seriously, right? This the studio session is that the first time that you started working with him? Yeah. Was yeah, there? I, I used to work with the the Phoenix Horns. Right. Okay. So you came in with them. Right after uh, what was it? No jackets required. Yeah. Um, the the trumpet player Michael Harris had to leave. Okay. So they needed a trumpet player. And, and I knew those guys, so they called me to fill in and fill in and fill in. And then uh, and he said, they said that Phil Collins was going to do an album soon. Yeah. But that album, it took about four years before he like, came around to it. Yeah, because wow. he, he did Buster, and then he, he toured with Eric Clapton, and I mean, there was always something. Uh, not yet, not yet. And yeah, that what, was the high, the high time. And... and was there pressure on that record? Did you feel any pressure in the studio? Because I'm, you know, the previous record had one album of the year, and that's a pretty big deal. Was there any pressure that you felt? Hey, can I curse? Sure, go ahead. Absolutely. You know, I'm from fucking Brooklyn. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Nothing intimidates the shit out of me. You better be. No, I, I well, no. You know, I'm a, I'm a studio trumpet player. I did, did you feel that there was pressure in the room? Did Phil feel pressure? Are you saying pressure? Yeah. No. It was it was like I was thinking, you know, my career as a musician is like an athlete. Okay. You, you know, you get you get brought into a certain team. And everybody thinks that you should feel like, wow, and, and you don't because you yeah. feel like you belong there. Yeah. It's a feeling you belong there. Yeah. yeah. You know, and, and then there's also an excitement. Wait till, you know, wait till he hears me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's not coming from an egotistic. No, I get that. Yeah. But, you know, I, that I guess that comes from confidence or something like that. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I'm gonna go do a. That's awesome. Gonna go work with Phil Collins, and uh, boy, is he in for a treat. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Were you disappointed that he went in a different direction on both sides? Because you guys have just done this huge, great tour. Yeah, uh, it, it was kind of. Um, I understood his his uh, reasoning behind it. Yeah, if they're his fans and they want to hear the hits. They're gonna have to suffer through the first half, right? Right. He would say it like that. Yeah. 
And he always said the first half is like black and white, and then the second half is in color. Right. So no horns at all in the first half. Yeah. It was interesting. We did a whole 18-month world tour, and and I learned how to play ping pong. <laughs> because you had nothing to do for an well, hour. You know, the show would start, and we'd be backstage for an hour and a half. Wow. It was always a, a ping yeah. pong. Yeah. Then ping pong is never drawn i was never drawn to play that as a child mm. but all of a sudden i'm playing ping pong and i got decent at it yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, and then we come out for the big second half and second that yeah it was non-stop playing it was so much fun yeah but uh well, I, yeah i was disappointed that he he just wanted to do what he recorded and no nobody else was in involved in live like, yeah yeah. So when we talk about the shows, uh, there's some bands, Grateful Dead, I, I suppose, there's some bands who do a different set every night, but that's never been Phil, right? It's always been, uh, the, the set's been planned out. I mean, Genesis recently too, it's always been the case. Well, you know why that's difficult to yeah. do with, with Phil and probably some of the other big concerts. Every song has special lighting. Right, right. And if you make a change, they they got to go in there in the last minute or, right, you know, and change the the set. They call it the set. The lights do this, the light, the sound, it's all automated. So if you put down, you know, another day in paradise, you push a button and, and, and the sound levels go to oh, that. Right, 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 right. Lights, the whole programming of the lights, you know, it, it, the only person I've seen do this, and and they didn't have specific lighting and stuff like this. Um, it was very old school. You know, you went to see the show. The show was spectacular. It was Bruce Springsteen. He'd uh. play the last quarter of a song. You know, you, maybe there was a list of three or four songs and then after that, you'd, they'd play the last two, a chord, and you could see it. They'd yell out the next tune, and then, bam, they would go right into the next tune. Yeah. And the reason they could do that is because that band's been together for over 30 years. Right, yeah. They know each other musically and everything. Yeah. And they didn't need to switch lights and all that kind yeah. of stuff. Yeah. So nobody knew what the next song. Like, well, I got the impression that people didn't know what the next song was going to be. They were all audible. So you just yell out the song. Yeah. When, yeah. When they felt everybody got it, he'd give a downbeat and the next song started. Not even a count off. That's how well the band knew each other. Yeah. That's something that we said about, you know, a band that's been together a long time, mm. you know, will always be better. Then, then, and, and I'm not saying that Phil or anybody else is there. You know, you can get the best musicians in the world, and to do a show, yeah, it won't sound as good as a band that's been together for 30 years. Yeah, mm-hmm. I see that. There's a whole that's a good point spiritual connection to the music. You know, yeah, yeah, no, that's a great point. I, so there wasn't a lot of room for, I mean, improvisation well, even in the songs, was there? I mean, would you deviate at all? It was it was done uh, ahead of time. Ahead of time, yeah. Like tomorrow night we're gonna do this. We're gonna lose that. We're gonna switch. Yeah, so that would happen the night yeah. before. But I guess all the technicians knew. Um, we would change depending on what we were playing, because he was very conscious of which songs sold or got more airplay than others. Oh, so yes. He, when we're in Germany, we add these songs because they were very popular there. We go to England, we cut these songs and add something else. Yeah. The United States definitely take some of these away, add these. So the sets were altered depending on the region where we we're playing. That's really cool. That yeah. is really cool. Yeah. Let's talk about the big band. Let's talk about Hot Night in Paris, which is a fantastic record. And by the way, um, Phil said in the liner notes, I just read it yesterday, um, that Harry Kim moved heaven and earth to make this happen. So talk to me about your role, how you guys pulled that off. But I, I'm very curious about, more so curious about the song selection. 
Well, you know, Phil talked to me, and I snapped my fingers and got it happening. And then yeah. <laughs> the, this, the whole big band thing started out in 94 when uh, Phil would introduce the guys in the band. Okay. I feel like I've told this story so many times. So if anybody's ever heard me I've say never this, heard this. I've never heard this. I make believe it's the first time anybody out yeah. there. <laughs> so, so Brad would mess around on the piano and he'd play Invisible Touch like a Vegas lounge. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then uh, Phil would go on with the introductions. And so one night he says, hey, can you add some horns? Or oh, in the way Phil would tell you. So Harry, could you add some horns to that? And then, yeah, so I, we added horns and um, we did a big high point thing, which sounded like a big band. And uh, so that was the birth of the idea. Of I did not know that. That is really cool. Yeah. So he talked about that. When was that? 2004? And then 2094. I mean, I'm sorry, 94. Uh, so what happened in 95? 90. So one of those years, he yeah. says, let's do the big band. And he flew me to Switzerland to talk about it. You know, so we yeah. sat down and, and Phil just wanted to play in a big band. <laughs> he did. And in his mind, we could do some Buddy Rich arrangements. Yeah. We could do some uh, you know, bass arrangements and all that. that. That's what he wanted to do. He was so excited to do that. And uh, I wish they would have recorded that because there's a, there's a documentary on yeah. this. Yeah, it's fantastic. I, I told him, and it wasn't recorded, you can't do this, Phil. You, you can't go out in public and play arrangements that everybody else plays. Yeah. There's a lot of bands that play Buddy Rich arrangements and, and, and Count Basie arrangements. There's a ton of bands. And, you know, most of those guys are getting together in somebody's living room every Monday night to play. If you want to do that, then get a band, get a bunch of guys to come to your house every Monday night and play. <laughs> Don't go in public. Yeah. You know, uh, me being a musician, I know that that's cheap. Yeah. You, you don't go out to a nightclub and present yourself as Phil Collins playing the same thing everybody else is playing. Sure. So I said, no, you, you got to you gotta do your originals, yours and Genesis. And and he goes, okay, that's that's good idea. So his office sent me every CD that Genesis and Phil has ever done. <laughs> and I listened, I listened to everything. And, uh, you know, and I got to tell you the truth. Uh, you know, I'm not a big listener. Okay. So I, I'm, not a, I'm not hip to a lot of stuff he recorded with Genesis or as himself prior, prior to me being in the band. Wow. I'm not a big, I'm not a music fan. <laughs> I listen to very little. Music. Yeah, I got. I know what you're saying. I know what you're saying. No, I mean because yeah, you know, most of the time I listen to stuff and I feel like playing, so I'd rather not listen. Yeah. I'd so you're listening. Get... You're listening to this stuff and you're thinking, what would translate well? Ah, uh, well. Anyway, so okay, I listened to everything. So I came up with a list of songs that I thought would be potentially. Uh, adaptable to a big band sound. Yeah. You know? And the thing was that Phil's music isn't isn't standard. It's hard to build uh, big band arrangements to his his stuff because standard big bands are, are created from tunes that have sections A, B, C, you know. So it might have A, repeat A, you got B, which is kind of like a, a bridge. Mm -hmm. And that goes back to A, and then or or it might hit an interlude, which Phil does that a lot. He'll just drop in an interlude, and uh, but not all the stuff is adaptable in that sort of a form. Right. 
So he said, go ahead. And we whittled it down to, I don't know how many chart, uh, how many songs. So then uh, I thought, well, let me designate arrangers, mm. best arrangers for that style or that particular tune. And uh, mm. so Tony Smith, his manager, gave me a budget, and uh, which I should, you know, back then I didn't have the chutzpah to say it's not enough. <sighs> doing a lot of work and that's why it says i moved heaven and earth <laughs> i didn't have a staff i should have had a staff of at yeah. least three people yeah. that's a lot of stuff starting with you know uh copying the music you know i send it out but then he makes changes it's got to re be recopied again but at that point we i didn't have a staff to do that so i'd have to fix it in the hotel room with uh staff music lines that come in the form of tape. So then I tape it over the part that needs to be changed. Yeah. If one note has to be changed, I had to change it on 18, 19 different parts. Oh my gosh. Yeah. The trombones, the, the saxes, the, you mm -hmm. know. Yeah. Yeah. So very time consuming. Uh, anyway, so I picked the charts that I wanted to do. I knew this is this is gonna call for my creative juices. Yeah. And there were a couple of songs that I actually called the arranger who wrote for uh, Count Basie. Wow. Yeah, like Invisible Touch. Yeah. You know, that's that's the Sammy Nestico who wrote for Frank Sinatra, for Count Basie, all these guys. And then I called um guy named John Clayton, who's a very, very well-known uh, arranger in many styles. He's fabulous. And he has a band that, you know, when you listen to a jazz big band, no one says jazz more than his band. Because hmm. he got a lot of Hollywood-type big bands. He got a lot of big bands all over the world that play great stuff. But John Clayton has a touch of jazz. You know, like yeah. Duke Ellington today. A, and, and by the way, John, John, uh, um, this guy, you remember that iconic uh, production of the national anthem by, I'm so old, I can't remember her name now. Um, she passed away. Oh, uh, Whitney Houston? Yeah. yeah. Have you ever heard of that? I think so. No, uh, no. You have to listen to that. Yeah. Because it's the most iconic version, and everybody who hears it says, isn't Whitney great? Isn't Whitney great? Isn't Whitney great? And I say, yeah, she's great. But you know what made that so great? The arrangement. Listening yeah. to the arrangement. Yeah. They didn't want to record that. It was uh, it was going to be mixed by the producers and stuff, and the actual producer of that of that number insisted to do it because the American national anthem is written in three. Right. And to them, it was sacrilege to do it any other way. And Chuck four. And then he took liberties with the chords. Hmm. You got to listen to that. Sure. And when yeah. You do that. You, you got to recognize that Whitney Houston was an amazing vocalist. But then on top of that, that was a once in a lifetime masterpiece of an arrangement. Mm. Mm. That and so did he work on this project? He wrote the arrangement. No, but he, did he work on the, the big band, the Phil Collins big band? Yeah. Yeah. He wrote uh, that's all he wrote. Uh, here, yeah, he wrote several uh, songs. That's all is an example of. I was going to say this. That sounds like a classic. That sounds like a standard. It sounds like it, high school bands, all college bands would be playing that all over the place. Ba -da -da -da, da -da -da -da. It just feels like a more than a Genesis song. It feels like a, a band standard. Well, that's one of the ones that started the whole thing. Let's do this, you know, and then I had to get somebody who yeah. could. Really 
not make it sound corny. This is such a big point, and I want you to elaborate on this because um, there's a uh, there's a lot of tribute albums out there to Phil Collins, to Genesis, to any band really that's put together fly by night people, jazz people, whatever. My a big pet peeve of mine is when a single instrument takes the vocal melody and plays it verbatim. And that's what I love about Hot Night in Paris is there's times where you don't know what song this is. You don't know what Phil or Genesis song this is unless you listen carefully. I mean, even Invisible Touch to a certain case. But it, it's a big pet peeve of mine when certain cover songs will just, somebody takes the, the vocal line and plays it verbatim. Uh, I find that it's just too on the nose for me. Uh, well, I agree. Yeah. You know. Yeah, to be an instrumentalist and, and interpret a vocal line, um, you got to take freedoms. Yeah, yeah. You, know, you have to interpret the melody at that point. You want to stay true to the vocal melody, but there's times that it doesn't work on an instrument. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and yeah, I mean that's an argument I have about musicians. Period. And okay, we should get into it, but. I find that a lot of musicians, very, very good musicians, very well-trained musicians, they just play the notes. Uh, they yeah. never... Yes. Yeah. I've Correct. heard you say that before with respect to whole notes. Yeah, well, the whole note. I always say the whole note has a life. Mm. You don't just go, bah, <laughs> bah, bah, you don't just do that. And for yeah. the audience, the whole note is a, a long, sustained note. Hmm. And uh, no, man, you got to be playing that note and listening to what's going on around you. And sometimes you sneak in and get louder mm -hmm. and then fade into the next one or you give yeah. it a lift if there's a big chord change going on. You know, uh, you don't just go by. Yeah. Bagpipe does that. You know? <laughs> yeah. Well, it's very much like a synthesizer, you know, bending the pitch of those notes. And yeah. Uh, yeah. So anyway, yeah. Uh, but a lot of guys, you know, a lot of people, they they, they honor the written note. Right, right. Yeah. So what was the, sorry, what was the directive then for these cover songs? Was it that that the um, mom and pop sitting in the audience would go, Invisible Touch right away? Or did, did Phil want these songs to be um, a little bit more richer in arrangement? Oh, that, that was the point. That was the point to take his songs, change the genre, yeah. and, and make it so that he was proud of it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. As a musical experience, you know. Um, the only thing that he was, I remember him being touchy about uh, was Susudium. Oh, okay. Because, um, I hired the arranger. Have you ever heard of The Tonight Show in L.A.? Sure. Yeah, and that, I mean that yeah. that went for years using the NBC Big Band. Okay, and one of the arrangers was the guy who wrote Susudio. I asked him because he was very very good at uh, you know that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, a production tune. Yeah, uh, meaning you know. Like whenever you watch a musical, oh, but you'd have to be of a certain age. You know, a musical variety show. Well, and, I always thought that the, the big band at record reminded me of Saturday Night Live. That's what I feel like, the, the tunes. The Susudio? Oh, yeah, Susudio and some of the bigger tracks feel like yeah. a Saturday Night Live band. Yeah, well, that's good. Yeah. To a lot of people older, they say, that sounds like the uh, Doc Severinsen Orchestra, right. you know. But that's because it was written by the guy who wrote a lot of... <laughs> So what was Phil's issue with Susudio? What, well, what was he, he protective he about? A lot of liberties. He okay. took a lot of liberties, okay. and, which was cool, but there were certain things that I told him, do not get away from this. Yeah. Uh -huh. Because that's what's identified with that song. For instance, don't mess with that. Play it yeah. exactly the way it is. And he would mess around with it and try to be clever. Yeah. But they didn't see that sacrilege. On yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that song, I, that song is probably the most, the closest to the original, I think. It, but it works. It's it works yeah. so well. 
Well, yeah. And, uh, you know, the breakdown for the sax solo and things like that. Very exciting. Very exciting. Oh, so good. Was there tunes that you, going back to your original list that you sent to Phil, were there Genesis tunes? Were there Phil deep cuts that, that you were in, really excited about that didn't get picked? Um, I, know, I know I'm asking you about something 35 years ago or, or so, but. Well, I really liked uh, Wood Gorilla. Oh, Brad, very interesting. Brad Cole wrote that arrangement. And very interesting. It needed to be tweaked. But I thought it was very effective. Da, 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 da. Very production. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. And how did that get cut? Was that just too much of a deep cut? I think I think Phil didn't like it right from the beginning. Oh. He nixed it. Uh I well, you know, you never know what going through somebody's mind when they're hearing stuff. And it yeah. wasn't quite what he wanted, but I thought it was genius. Red are there are but there I, demos of this stuff kicking around? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> let me turn the cameras off here oh that's funny the thing about it was you know phil doesn't read music right so that was part of the project you know i, I had a budget and got the band the whole band in a studio uh to record all the songs mm. you know sound man and everything mixed it and gosh they didn't have that much internet going on we recorded and made cassettes cassette tapes yeah and then we um we shipped them over to switzerland and that's part of that is in the documentary yeah i was wondering how much of that is real but phil's doing the dishes and and learning the 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 songs the arrangements yeah. Yeah, but yeah. There's, there's the part where he talks about he'd been waiting for weeks for this, and um, they deliver the cassette. And he puts it in his cassette player, and he's actually hearing it for the first time. And the first thing that's up was uh, Invisible Touch. You know, so it starts with this very quiet piano thing, and then... That big hit, right? Yeah, but it very subtly gets da 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 uh, I gotta can, watch, I gotta rewatch it. I have seen that moment. He is speechless. Yeah, like a kid. He tries to say something after that. It, four or five attempts to say something, and he can't. It won't come out. He's, <laughs> I'm not kidding. And all, and that was intended for him to listen. Yeah, and yeah. learn. Yeah, you know, memorize them. There's so much to memorize in a big band chart, you know. If he does hit. a those surprising hits where I think must have been something he was aware of because or appreciated because he has one on face value on if leaving me is easy and just out of nowhere. And and uh I mean it's that's an incredible part of music, but yeah, that's a great part. I that would be really interesting to hear for the first time. Yeah, and um uh, what else? The first tune that he started practicing was on brushes. Right. Are you brushes. Yeah. yeah. And was that Invisible Touch too? Like the the the, the, the intro? It may be. Because it, it really pissed him off because it doesn't have any brush technique. Uh, yeah, I haven't seen him play brushes other than that documentary. This is right away. There's brushes. Yeah, it was must have been frustrating. <laughs> As a matter of fact, he brings in Charlie Watts to say something about brushes in that documentary. Yeah, 
Yeah. But yeah, he worked really hard listening to this stuff day and night, day and night, day and night. And he was making up his own notes, which is like hieroglyphics. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, it would have been easier for him to learn how to read music. <laughs> his hieroglyphics. Yeah. And, yeah. and that documentary takes you through the whole rehearsal process and everything. It's so cool. Yeah. And and the thing was, that was the first, uh, or, was it 96, was it? Yeah. It must 90, have been because it's different. The album was many years later. Yeah. 98, he did it again and he was much better. Mm. He would have done it maybe two more times. He would have mastered it. Right. Because there are so many different ways to accent a note. Hmm. Big band. Yeah. You know, sometimes it's what we don't play that accents. Mm. Sometimes it's just the bass drum or it's just the snare without the cymbal. You know, he got most of his hits he's doing with the cymbal and the snare. Right. Sometimes it's just the cymbal, you know, because yeah. there's subtle hits. Yeah. But uh, you know, he got better on the second tour. The first tour, he was just like everything was like he's playing in rock. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That must but, have been cool for him to kind of be set back like that to to take the role of a student for a while, so late in his career. Yeah, but you, you know, he's got such great musical instincts. Yeah, that yeah. he was able to do it. He was able to do it, and and on top of that, uh, when 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 this whole thing, started, there was a lot of skepticism hmm. in his band. They thought oh. it was a ridiculous thing to do. Oh, and then when it came, everybody wanted a little credit. You know, yeah, so, yeah, no. that's right. Yeah, um, but. Okay, yeah, was you. Um, I want to talk to you real quick, and, and I don't want to take too much more of your time. But I, I want to ask you. We were talking on the phone a couple weeks ago. We were talking about because um, you know, just to the to the viewers out there, Harry and I, we call each other at least once a week and chat on the phone. But um, you were talking about we were talking about critics, and we were talking about how critics uh, gave Phil a real hard time back then. And, and there's a sense that that's changing a little bit now. And, and, and I think as people, I, I think you had said that maybe the critics are gone, but, you know, hopefully I, I think that people are looking back more fondly on the eighties and on, on his contribution. Let's talk about hits. Cause I heard you say recently, and I'm kind of paraphrasing, but basically correct me if I'm wrong. We were talking about that Phil didn't necessarily go out to write a hit. He wrote songs, and other people were the ones who determined whether or not they were a hit. Um, yet, he is criticized for making too many hits. Um, talk to me a little bit about that. Yeah, Phil, Phil was criticized for being a formula writer, which he wasn't. He just wrote from, from his heart. Yeah. Um, you know, let's say for five years... Brown loafers are really in style. Mm -hmm. And Phil is a guy who made beautiful brown loafers. <laughs> it's not his Great fault. analogy. It's, it's not his fault that he yeah. did really well. Yeah. The critics, especially, you know, these music critics, I don't want to use expletives, but... They thought he should be more innovative. Mm. And they criticized him all the time. You know, and uh, the people the people that went to the concerts to do to write reviews, they took the word, you know, critic too, too literally. Seriously. Yeah. <laughs> you don't mean necessarily have to criticize all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. I got the sense, and I've said this before, I got the sense that whatever critic wrote the article the next morning wasn't at the show or right. was only there for the first three songs. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I don't doubt that. They didn't see the reaction of the crowd as the show went on. 
if the, if the guy would have stayed to the end, he wouldn't say stuff like he was boring and people were, uh, what is the word? Uh, they were not attached to the. Yeah, to, that's. You know, they yeah. would they wouldn't say stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, engage. That's the word. Sure. 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 Uh, I remember what the shows by the by the last third of it till the end, you're just exploding. It was that exciting, even yeah. when he was sitting. And um, it's yeah. just, yeah. and so, so especially in England, they trashed him all the time. They trashed him, and believe it or not, it affected him. Yeah, yeah, One I've heard that. that. He retired the first time is because, you know, he couldn't do anything right according to um, yeah. Dix. So what I think happened was his fans. Most of them read the book. A hundred percent agree, Harry. I a hundred percent agree. They experienced what he went through. Empathy. He was beloved. He yeah. was adored by the time he came out to the uh, Not Dead Yet to him. So you noticed a difference from oh, 2004 he, to 2016. And all those asshole critics died <laughs> yeah. and a whole, yeah. whole generation of critics when we talk about the and I, I think it's so lovely to hear about um how that changed um uh, in in the most recent tour but um one of the things i'm interested in is you being classically trained being in the jazz world teaching lectures I picture guys like you snubbing your noses to pop stars like Phil. Uh, it's just surprising to me about how you have your feet in both worlds of uh, of being a horn player for these big hits. Um, uh, that surprises me. Well, it goes to show you I'm not a snob. <laughs> yeah. I talk to Canadians, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> Let me, let me go back or finish my story about please the Phil's retirement. We 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 start out the not dead yet tour as an experiment. Four weeks to see how the crowd reacts. And 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 it it ended up almost three years. Wow. We did we did 2017, 2018, 2019. Highly successful. People came to see that person that created the soundtrack to their lives. I am not kidding. Mm. From the first song, which like I, I told you over the phone, it's unheard of to start a rock and roll show with a ballad. Right. You right. Know? And immediately the entire stadium, 70,000 people are singing along with that song. Yeah. Against all odds. Was that the first song? Yeah. Yeah, I think it was. What was that? What, what was the idea behind starting with that tune? Well, you know, you saw the show. I regretfully did not. All right. So the show I was there in 2004, but I, I missed it and I, it, I'll uh, take that to my grave. I regret it. So the show starts, you know, uh, there's a chair in the middle of the stage and a little. Old fashioned spotlight. Yeah. And then there's a curtain that's covering most of the stage, a curved curtain. So the minute he walks on stage, the people are screaming. And he thanks them. And he and he tells them a little story about how his legs is fucked up from a surgery gone bad and this and that. And that he's going to sing some songs that he hopes the people like. They're already crazy. They've been waiting yeah. for this. Reasons. And he starts off with Against All Odds. Yeah, yeah. People start cheering. And uh, we, you know, I didn't play. Those of us who didn't play the first few songs, which were mainly the horn players, we made sure we watched the beginning of the show because it yeah. was was so emotion. That's you incredible. Know? So he sings this song, 
And then when we get to the point where there's the drum break, lights go on behind the curtain, so you see the silhouette of Nick playing the drum oh, solo. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> and then, then you start seeing the silhouette of the band behind the curtain. And, by you know, it's built-in emotion. Unbelievable. These people are singing. And then, you know, after the song, curtain goes up, and they go into the, the show, you know? And yeah. every song is so nostalgic that people are singing. They're singing. They're singing. They're supporting him. And I invited a few people. Uh, I, and when we played in New York, I invited a girl that, that I went to high school with. Mm -hmm. I knew she wasn't a Phil Collins fan. She said she didn't even know the music. Uh, but she came to see me, you know? Yeah. So, uh, so after the show, because they had a party at Madison Square Garden, and uh, she came to the party, and she said she was in tears. Wow. She didn't realize how much his music had affected her whole life. Wow. And the song was a song she used to sing to her husband as he was dying. Wow. So you could imagine the emotion. And that's just one person. You know, when I've talked to fans, I've gotten to know fans throughout their whole life. Phil, this is, I mean, there's a certain amount of, um, I don't know, I'm sure there's some kind of psychological term for this, Del delusional maybe. Uh -huh. <laughs> they believe that they were going through very tough emotional times, you know, at any age. Uh, and they listened to Phil. Phil was speaking to them personally. Mm -hmm. It meant so much to them to see Phil live, to hear him singing those songs that meant so much to them throughout their lives. Yeah. So all this combined, you know, plus they read his book. And then next morning, you read the articles, no matter where in the world, the word triumphant. Wow. Was most commonly used. In, wow. No matter what language. Yeah. You know, yeah. Pop, you know, triumph, all this, you know, that yeah. he's come back in, in triumph. Amazing. It was amazing. And, yeah. uh, and as a musician, as all of us were, we became family. We we really love Phil, and to see him finally reach that place, it was emotional for all of us. All incredible to have experienced that last tour. Was was that your favorite tour? It's hard to um, it's hard to yeah. You can't say favorite. It's like a woman. You can't say which is my favorite wife. Yeah, you know, they're all unique. Yeah, <laughs> every single one of yeah. your special loves were unique. Right. <laughs> I'm serious. Yeah. You know, yeah. Sure. You cannot say uh, one tour was better than the other. Yeah, that's fair. No, that's yeah. fair. And and if I look at that, you know, like um, like what the question was earlier, the snobby musician. You know, I would stub my nose and say, uh, eh, you know, it's, it's just a job. Yeah. But yeah. Everyone is unique. Everyone has a different experience. It looks like you're getting a little, you're losing a little bit of reception. There I, again. I can hear you perfectly fine. So I, I'm hoping it's just my side. All right. So you never, or I never, lose track of the I'm I'm as a trumpet player the Phil Collins gig was the most coveted trumpet gig on earth really yes I've I've learned this later when I talk to other trumpet players and and the videos of uh, of uh serious tour and all the videos yeah. that you know the touring musicians will watch these on the bus when mm. they were and you know, the musicians in LA, they they would tell me that everybody wanted that gig. Oh yeah. And I, that, I don't know how I got it. It just fell on my lap. Yeah. Truly, truly did. It just fell on my lap. So now you're going around the world and you're 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 going first class. You know, say we go to Europe, 
first class. And then from there, we start to tour on a private jet. Wow. We never have to do the schlepping, the six o'clock in the morning lobby. Yeah. Yeah. The airport. yeah. It was all done so that we're all happy. Phil says, you know, it's almost like he said, is it okay to leave the hotel at noon? Very. <laughs> <laughs> they used to do stuff like okay breakfast is over it closes at 10 no they left it open later for us wow. you know it wow. was people could not believe when i described the tours you know it was club med it was like <laughs> it was vacation i could bring the family my wife was out the entire first tour i did with them and then in 94 my wife came, and then I brought my little boy with me. Also, amazing. He um, he celebrated his third birthday and his fourth birthday on the road. Wow, you know, that's people, incredible. Some people used to feel sorry for me. <laughs> you know, it must be tough being on the road with the family and all that. Stuff. It okay. must be tough not being on the road in between those tours. Well, so that's the point, you know. Like, I I was grounded enough to realize what an amazing blessing it was to do each and every one of those tours yeah like you can't you can't say which are your favorite yeah. they're all special they're all special in different ways and uh i don't know if you've seen some of the interviews but this last tour was incredibly uh special because i had to i was coming to terms with the death of my wife and i've heard no, of that i'm sorry yeah you know thank you but it was amazing healing process that went on during that tour. Wow. You know, same songs, many of the same venues, staying in many of the same hotels that he, she, and, 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 and my son, you know, would be in, uh, you know, there were special moments in the show where my wife and, and the publicists and the wardrobe girls and the catering girls would all line up on stage left. And they do the same choreography as the background singers, like yeah. Can't Hurt the Love and stuff yeah. like that. Yeah. Every show they were out there doing that, and uh, she wasn't there. Hmm. Last two. But I'd look to the left and I'd see her. I'd oh, feel it. Man. Wow. So it was great. It was a great thing. So, all right. If you want to say which was the most special, that would be it. But, oh, man. Thank you for sharing that. That is incredible. That's incredible. What? what's next for you, Harry? I mean, is there something you've done so much? Is there something creative that you haven't done yet that you, that you still would like to try? Well, I want to go into deep sea diving. There you go. Does the, does the horn work under there, under the water? I'm just kidding. You know, I met a sax player. His, his goal was to set a record, uh, and his goal was to climb the top of Mount Everest and play the saxophone. Oh, that seems like a terrible idea. Oh, yeah. You couldn't get the note started the first time. You know, he's like, yeah. <laughs> 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 but I mean, you quite impressive to make it to the top of Mount Everest and then pull your sax out, play a few notes and come back down. Yeah. I think, you know, but that's yeah. <laughs> good. good. <laughs> so, I have something in the works, which I don't want to talk about. Okay. Uh, okay. Because, um, it's such an overwhelming project. I don't want to talk about it in case I, I don't end up doing it. Oh. You know? Oh. Well, like, I hear you. Quincy Jones once told me he was going to go to Mexico for six months to write a musical about Sammy Davis Jr. Yeah. So, uh, that was it. And then about two months later, I saw him at this big pre-Grammy party uh, that I was performing at. And I said, well, how's that play? How's that musical coming along? And he looked at me. He said, life is too short. <laughs> <laughs> Just decided to make fun. I mean, I really want to do this project. I want to see if I have what it takes to do it. And so I don't want to talk about okay. it. All right. Well, I, I'll, we'll leave it at that. I want to. I want to tell you, um, it is. Uh, it is so incredible to speak with you, and I appreciate you um, taking this time. And and as we've talked about YouTube videos too, and these tours, 
Um, it's been so great for YouTube, for fans like us to be able to relive that. I watched the Serious Hits tour. I was there. I was a nine-year-old in Toronto and uh, or eight-year-old. And um, I, I, I still watch that, I would say, twice a year. I watch that entire DVD front to back. I see your big cheeks exploding all the time. And uh, it's just such an honor to speak with you. So thank you for this on a micro level, but on a macro level, thank you for the intro to hanging long enough and, and the tours and everything. It's it's a real gift to us. And the slippery thing in the middle of the studio. And the slippery thing on the live version that I'm gonna listen to now. And that Watt Gorilla version that I'm going to just imagine in my mind every time I hear it. Uh, I think it's great. Brad Cole, I told him. I don't tell him enough. <laughs> I, I love it. Yeah. The Rage Race gets rejected. We didn't even play it live. Forget about the album. Yeah. <laughs> but I liked it. Very powerful. Thank you so much for doing this. Let me hit, hit stop on the recording here. Okay. Thank you for having me. 